Vă invit să reocupați locurile. Iubiți oameni lui Dumnezeu, vă binecuvântez în numele Domnului Isus în această seară și mă bucur că putem fi împreună la această frumoasă părtășie. Aduc sfinte salutări din partea bisericii din Chiciner, salutul bisericii fiind psalmul 20, să vă asculte Domnul în ziua necazului. Mă bucur că împreună cu soția mea, Diana Bălulescu, pot să fiu împreună în această seară cu dumneavoastră, însoțiți de câțiva frați din adunarea noastră, fratele păstor Vasile Hozan, familia Oprea, familia Gorcea și alte familii cu câțiva tineri care au venit împreună cu noi la această părtășie. Salutăm cu multă căldură și cu multă bucurie întreaga convenție, dorim ca Dumnezeu pe toți să ne binecuvânteze. Avem și noi un cuvânt de mulțumire familiei Costea, fratelui Elian, sore Felicia pentru organizarea frumoasă, Bisericii Filadelfia, bordului de conducere. Vă mulțumim pentru ce ați făcut pentru noi și modalitatea în care ne-ați primit la această frumoasă părtășie. Dumnezeu să vă binecuvânteze cu har și cu ajutor în tot ceea ce aveți nevoie. Din partea fraților păstori din Canada am fost însărcinat să aduc un salut. Fratele păstor Iosif Feher de la Montreal m-a rugat să salut convenția, precum și fratele păstor Gheorghe Diaconescu de la Windsor care m-a rugat să vă salut cu har și pace din partea Lui Dumnezeu să lase binecuvântare peste fiecare dintre noi. What would Jesus do? It is a phrase that was coined by Charles Sheldon in his book in 1896. And this phrase became adapted to be put on bracelets that young people love to wear and demonstrate as a proof of their Christianity, expressing what would Jesus do in critical moments of life when we have questions, difficulties, and situations that can arise. For example, when you're driving down the road, someone cuts you off, you want to open the window and wave to them in a very impolite manner. As soon as you're about to take your hand out the window, you see WWGD and you think, well, maybe it's not the best thing to do. Or suppose you're at school and you're about to write an exam and as you didn't study well enough because you went to church or other excuses you would have had, you're about to peek over your shoulder and see what your neighbor's writing and as you're putting your hand back to write, you see WWGD and maybe it's not right to really cheat and copy from other people. What would Jesus do is supposed to imply the idea of this moral code that we should abide by. But the reality, my friends, is that though many people will not accept Christ as their savior or his deity, many will acclaim that Jesus Christ was a just, good and moral man that did good to those around them. He had an impact in the community, society that he lived in. Of course, there, therefore, what would Jesus do should be important to us and to our lives. If we want to talk about impact nowadays, my friends, I would like to argue that the world does not need more copies of comedians, for example. The world has enough comedians to make people laugh. Someone like Robin Williams, who has passed some time ago, was able to make comedy with a pencil and a scar for one hour long. Though, despite those facts, he passed away. Now, those of us who try to bring our Romanianisms and our Sarmal into the jokes, I don't think we would have any edge on top of him. The world does not need more copies of comedians. The world does not need more copies of intellectuals. In Canada, we have Dr. Jordan Peterson, a famous psychologist, who in a debate with a leftist was being told, you are just a mean, mad, white man. How do you argue against an argument like that? You see, the world does not need more than intellectuals. What the world needs is people who have the power of God in them and who can have an impact in the world that they live in. That is what the world needs nowadays. And that impact is intricately tied to the idea of holiness, to the idea of God being in us and God's holiness in us. About Jesus Christ, it was said, we know that God does not listen to sinners. Then why is God making miracles through him? They were questioning his deity. They were questioning who he was. When it comes to the idea of what the world expects from us, they want to see perfection in our lives and they hold us to that standard. But moreover, they want to see results of that sanctification and holiness in our lives. They want to see an impact in the world around them. Allow me to give you an example of how impact looks like. Earlier this year, a young mother in our church gave birth. And after she gave birth, a little while later, she started having serious pains. She went to the hospital and was found that she had stones in her gallbladder. It was causing intense pain every single night for one month long. She couldn't eat, she couldn't drink, she couldn't sleep properly. In the last two weeks before she requested prayer, every single night consistently for three hours, she was suffering. After these two weeks of intense pain, she decided to make a call and said, I want you to guys 
to come pray for us. I want you to pray for me, and I believe that God can make a miracle. And we went to pray with the pastoral council. We anointed her with oil, and we prayed. We can't do anything more than just that, but we invoke the power of God who has able to do more things than we can ask for. But you see, this relationship of God working is intricately tied to the idea of holiness. This is why in James 5, 16, it says, the effective prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God can change when we pray. And when that prayer is bound in a life lived in Christ, God will make miracles. After that prayer that night, the next day she called us and said, since the prayer, I've had no more pain. One day, two days, three days, two weeks passed by, six weeks passed by, no more pain at all. I can eat, I can sleep, no pain. But the most important thing was that when she went to the hospital sometime later to be checked, and I, I might add before we prayed, she was told that there's nothing that the medics can do. The only thing that will solve her issue is to remove the gallbladder in surgery. And they said, unfortunately, we're backlogged, so surgery is gonna be some months out. Medication wasn't working, nothing else was working. After this prayer, no more pain. She goes to the hospital, gets checked, and they say, in the ultrasound we did, we cannot find the stones in the gallbladder. And this is a difficult issue for us because one, these things cannot be eliminated, and two, they do not just dissolve. What happened here? And what happened there, my friends, was God miraculously intervened. This is the power of God to heal, to save, to change. This is the God that we serve, and I say praise be his name. But this work that God does is intricately tied to the idea of holiness. And God expects this holiness to flow through our lives. If you want, holiness is God's standard. Righteousness is holiness lived out in our lives. This is why the powerful prayer of a righteous man avails much, one who lives in holiness. The problem is that the version of holiness that you have might differ from the version of holiness I have. And this very relative world we live in, we really do not know what these terms mean any, anymore. And for this reason, tonight's message is titled, Called to be Holy. My desire with this message is to explain three things. That the call to be holy begins with a changed identity. Number two, that the call to be holy forms a call according to an appropriate model. And number three, that the call to be holy must permeate every fiber of our lives. So let's begin. The call to be holy, my friends, begins with a changed identity. Verse 14 says as follows, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, observe two things. Before we are saved, two elements are present. One, there is living in ignorance, and number two, there's living in lusts. Ignorance means willful blindness. We know that God expects something of us, but we do not want to see it, so we shut our eyes and keep them closed. That's willful ignorance. I do not want to do what God wants me to do. But simultaneously with this ignorance that the world is in is also living in lusts. This is what the devil entices people with. This is what the devil binds people with and draws people in with. And with these lusts, he pulls their lives in every direction that he wants. Fundamentally, the same temptation reapplies. Be your own God. Do whatever you want. You do not want God to tell you what to do, but you can do whatever you want to do. And this is the state of life before we are saved by God. As we come to Christ and are regenerated, we are born again, we have our status changed, and from strangers to God, we become children of God. This is why it says, as obedient children. And this child-parent relationship implies the idea that we are supposed to belong to God as a father. Allow me to make a statement tonight, my, my friends. If you see your Christian life as strictly being a burden of rules and regulations, then chances are that one, you are not a child of God, and number two, you have not yet matured spiritually. And this is why I have nine children by the grace of God with my wife. My nine children do not find our house rules weird because they are our house rules. But if they go to someone else's house, they find those rules very weird. In our home, we don't do it this way because you're not in your home. But when they're in my home, they fit in perfectly because they're my children. They abide by these rules and that identity is rooted in them. Similarly, as children of God, that identity must be placed within our hearts. More so, 
When they are immature, we bind them with rules and regulations. And for this reason, when someone is very young, we say, don't play with knives, don't play with fire, don't play in the road, because these are dangerous activities. What should we do? Wait for them to grow up. And as they grow up, we no longer tell them to do these things because they're implicit in their life. We know not to play with knives. We know not to play with fire. We use them appropriately. Why? We have matured. Unless your life has reached this level of maturity in being a child of God, you will always see your Christian life as a burden of rules and regulations. When it comes to the idea of the qualifier of this identity, the word is obedience, as obedient children. And the idea of obedience means a framework through which we can see God and reflect on God's desires. Watch how this is identified in 1 Peter 1 verse 2. Elected, these people who are saved are elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God the Father wanted to save us. In his foreknowledge, foreknowing what would happen in those who would believe in Christ, in Christ he chose us to be saved. In Christ, those who would respond affirmatively to that call of faith would be saved. Not predetermination, foreknowledge of God, explicitly stated in the scriptures. Also, in the sanctification of the Spirit, meaning the agent that consistently changes my life inwardly is the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved brothers and sisters, those of us who call to have a heritage in Pentecostalism, allow me to say, the Holy Spirit was not just given that we may speak in tongues one night at prayer. The Holy Spirit was given to sanctify our lives. If you want to know if you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, show me the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yes, we need to pray in tongues. Yes, we need the gift of prophecy. We want the demonstration of the Spirit, but we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. May God sanctify our lives. And moreover, my friends, we are called unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the root relationship. As we become his children, we must obey God who is our Father. Holiness has to do with a change identity. And this change identity works the moment we are born again. The call to be holy must begin with a change identity. But it must also form according to an appropriate model. Number two, it must form according to an appropriate model. Watch this in verse 14 once again. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. You are called to be holy, my friends, according to the rules that God sets for you. If I want to demonstrate that I'm doing a healthy job with my body, I would say I'm not overweight because to me overweight means something specific. However, if I go to the doctor using a specific scale and the measurements needed, they will tell me if I am overweight. It's an objective way of assessing. From my standpoint, I just love sugar. There's no sin in that. So on that basis, I'm not overweight. The doctor, however, is objectively looking at my statistics. This is what God wants for us when it comes to the idea of holiness. The form that we are supposed to conform to is a specific model, and that model is called Jesus Christ. When it comes back to being holy, I think I'm very holy. Compared to these nepokaites around me, I'm very holy. This is how we usually look at holiness. However, our standard of comparison is not us or those around us. Our standard of comparison is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's why you are called to be holy according to the one who is holy. And may God help us in this. If you want to know what sanctification and holiness meant in the life of Jesus Christ, look at the cost he was willing to pay. He was willing to go and obey the word of the Father up to the point of dying on the cross. Allow me to ask you a question. What have you paid for Christ lately? What have you given for Christ lately? Given the fact that you are called to be His, given the fact that you are called to sanctify yourself, what is that sanctification costing you practically as a Christian every single day? If those around you don't find you weird because your values are weird, then I really ask if you are truly being sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our model that we conform to is called Jesus Christ. Christ. And we're supposed to conform to him, looking towards him as an obedient child to the power of God in relationship with Jesus Christ who calls us to be holy as he is holy. 
But you see, the call to be holy must begin with a changed identity and must be according to an appropriate model. But now, it has to be permeating in every single fiber of your life. At this point, I want to spend a bit of time because it's fundamentally important. This is really the crux of the issue when it comes to the idea of being called to be holy. We want to impact the world. The young generation wants to make a move, wants to make an impact, leave a legacy behind. You will leave a legacy behind when you will be truly sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that will be manifest to those around you. The call to be holy, number three, must permeate every single fiber of your life. Watch verse 15 one more time. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Not in the domains of life where you want to be holy. In every single aspect of your life, you have to be holy. You see, when we come to God, we're willing to give him everything but those few things that are very important to us. I remember when we were back in the pandemic, and in Canada it was quite complex as opposed to was, it was here in the States, we had to do three and four services at one point to be able to accommodate the entire church. We were in, under lockdowns and limitations of space and very complicated things. And one day as we were having lunch together between services with a very minimal team that we were able to have there in church, we were discussing the idea of health and I was saying, I, I think it'd be important to cut back on some sugars, at least for me speaking. I think I could benefit from cutting back some of the chocolate of to eat. I love chocolate. I could, I could eat chocolate as much as it's give, given to me. And one of my friends who was there was saying, you know, we as Pentecostals have very few pleasures in life. Don't take chocolate away. It's one that we have for crying out loud. Leave chocolate, leave coffee. You, you've taken almost everything away. Leave these things for us. This is the issue with sanctification. We believe we are holy because we apply holiness to those domains of life that are fitting to us. What about those domains of life that are not fitting to us and that God wants us to also sanctify? When Peter invokes the word conduct, in all of your conduct, it means manner of life or behavior. It appears 13 times in the New Testament, eight of which are used by the Apostle Peter in his two epistles. If we were to summarize these usages of this word, I would composite to you three key areas where we are called to be holy in all of our conduct. And you're not going to like this because we don't. This is a difficult message to preach. We love to pray about, we love to preach about prayer and power and Holy Spirit and love and salvation. But when it comes to sanctification, this cuts deep because this has to do with our conforming to the model of Jesus Christ. Now, whether you like it or not, it's my duty to preach the counsel of God. And may God help us listen to it as the Lord instructs us. Number one, my friends, holy in all of your conduct has to do with external, personal appearance. We don't believe this matters, but it does. And according to the word of God, it does. Watch 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 1. It's a specific passage, but the principle is generally applied. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even in, if some do not obey the word, they without word may be won by the conduct, the behavior of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on fine apparel. And this is the point where we have to recognize that sanctification and holiness has to do with how we present ourselves outwardly. For example, makeup, jewelry, immodest clothing, improper hairstyles, missing head coverings, homosexual styles, and mannerisms. These do not demonstrate holiness in our lives. And this is when you say time out. Legalism. This is a legalistic message. Stop. We've moved beyond that. This is old style Romanian Pentecostalism. But my friends, I wanna say these two things to you. The Lord does not just look at the heart as we say. It's one verse very badly beaten out of context within the book of Samuel. When the Lord looks at the heart, out of the heart springs the issues of life. And what you're on the outside, you're fundamentally on the inside. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, stems outwardly from the inside, our hearts. When it comes to this idea of God does not care about these details, allow me to give you a very simple, plain example. We have a God who really cares about details. Do you know how much God cares about details? One day, the priests were moving the Ark of the Covenant. And as they're moving it, they put it in a new cart. And they were moving it along to this new location. As they were taking a turn, the Ark of the Covenant almost fell, up, fell down. And Azza, a man who loved God dearly, who was there ministering to God, stretches out his hand and wants to stop the Ark of the Covenant. And God kills him 
on the spot. Now here's the question, why? Why would God kill Uzzah on the spot when he did a favor to God? He cared about the Ark of the Covenant. He didn't want it to get damaged or dirty or put down. He really cared. Why did Uzzah die? Because when you go back in the fine print of the Levitical law, my friends, it states that the Ark of the Covenant was always supposed to be carried on the shoulders. Now, we've moved along, technology's advanced. We have chariots and we have carts and we have cars in our modern technology. Why should we still carry it as a burden? We have a carriage, let me put it there, and it's gonna be safer than carrying on a shoulder. Well, God cares about those details. We might gloss over them and squeeze over them and we say it doesn't matter because fundamentally to God, these rules don't really matter. But God actually cares. And when it comes back to holiness and sanctification, your call to be holy in your outward appearance, may God help us in this. I know you're not going to say amen because it's not a pretty message. It's not a message you want to hear, but it's a message that's necessary in this world. If you want the world to notice you as a changed individual by the power of God, stop copying the style of the world and demonstrate the sanctification the Holy Spirit has put in your heart. May God help us in this. Call to be holy in all of your conduct, and that includes the way we present ourselves outwardly. But it goes deeper than that because we say, but that's just superficial stuff. So what if we upgrade ourselves in the way that we look? What about when we get a level deeper, my friends? Because the call to be holy in all your conduct also includes personal lifestyle. First of Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Aimless means without any purpose without any usage. So allow me to give you an example of what aimless conduct looks like. Things that mean nothing and do really nothing in terms of your practical lifestyle and especially in terms of your salvation. Video games, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, Netflix, YouTube, shows, parties, drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality, whoa, that's way too much. Wait, we can't do all these things? Allow me to ask you, what purpose do they serve in your life and how have they helped you recently to sanctify your lives? Those hours spent on short videos on YouTube, those hours spent on Netflix browsing video after video, how have they helped you overcome those battles and temptation that you've been dealing with for the past little while? Because we come to church and we think that when we come here, we can just start worshiping God and God has to accept our worship because hey, we put in the time, we practiced, we got ready for the convention and we got here to be able to do a show for God. God looks at the way that your life looks like. Is it purposeful? Or is it aimless? Because fundamentally what really scares me, my friends, is that we're willing to sing songs that fundamentally condemn us and we don't even recognize that. We sing about the fact that God is an all-consuming fire and yes, he is. And then we say, God, bring down your all-consuming fire. Two priests were ministering before the Lord and they brought strange fire within the context of their ministry. Do you know what happened? God brought down real fire. And he killed them on the spot again. And you might say it sounds really dark, but this is the fundamental message. We have a holy God, my friends, and God does not play with his holiness. God does not change his holiness because I'm called Andre and you're called Steve. God does not care about how we look and who we are. God looks fundamentally with what's inside and how that really comes on the outside of us. This is what God expects when it comes to fundamental holiness in our lives. Is your life being purposeful for God? Or is your conduct just being aimless and useless in terms of your everyday living? What's your purpose in terms of living for God? What have you achieved spiritually in the last little while, spending so much time online and in meetings and friendships and many other things? What was the last thing you had an impact on the world around you, proven by the power of sanctification and the Holy Spirit, demonstrated through the effects of the mercy and the power of God? Be holy in all of your conduct. May God help us in this. And lastly, my friends, holiness has to do with personal integrity. God cares about our, our exterior appearance. God cares about our personal lifestyle, but God also cares about our personal integrity. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Having good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile you, your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. When they revile and make fun of you, your good conduct should put them to shame. And this really now begs the question, 
when you're cutting lines, when you're driving erratically, when you're being obnoxious, when you're gossiping, when you're backstabbing, when you're hating, when you're demeaning, when you're aggressive, when you're bullying your friends who come to youth Bible study, when you betray and you cheat those around you, what kind of conduct are you showing? Conduct that doesn't just get condemned by Christians, but especially by non-Christians. Lately, I've observed that you guys don't do what you preach. I don't need a Christ like that. I don't need a church like that. I'm scared of the way you guys are. And this proves that our testimony has been put down because of the conduct and the integrity that we demonstrate as Christians. My friends, the call to be holy is rooted in the identity which means we were saved in Jesus Christ. The call to be holy must be properly established in the relationship of the form, the standard of Jesus Christ. And it must permeate every single aspect of our lives in everything that we do. So that next time you say, what would Jesus do? Remember, he would tell you, be holy, for I am holy. Amen.